Welcome back. All right, so this is chapter nine, video two, and we're talking about regression wisdom. And with that, we're gonna talk about lurking variables and causation. No matter how strong the association, no matter how large the R squared value, no matter how straight the line, there is no way to conclude from reg regression alone that one variable causes the other. There's always the possibility that some third variable is driving both of the variables you have observed. When ob with observational data as opposed to data from a uh, designed experiment, there is no way to be sure that a lurking variable is not the cause of any apparent association. The following scatter plot shows that the average life expectancy for a country is related to the number of doctors per person in that country. So you can see that as the square root of the doctors per person increases, so does the life expectancy in a linear fashion. Okay, if you do the same thing, if you do square root of TVs per person, you can see the same thing. This new scatter plot shows that the average life expectancy for a country is related to the number of televisions per country in the uh, per person in that country. Well, TVs are cheaper than doctors, so should we send TVs to countries with low life expectancies in order to extend lifetimes? No. Um, there might be a lurking variable that makes more sense. Countries with higher standards of living have both longer life expectancies and, do and more doctors and more TVs. And higher living standards, uh, if higher living standards cause changes in these other variables, improving living standards might be expected to prolong lives and increase the number of doctors and increase the number of TVs. Scatter plots of statistics are summarized over, uh, summarized over groups tend to show less variability than we would see if we measured the same variable on individuals. Uh, that's true for, for data in general, is that when you are looking at averages, when you're looking at summaries, they're more stable. That's why we report student averages for a whole entire semester. That's what goes on your transcript versus, you know, just randomly picking out a single test grade. There's great variability among individual observations, much less so over when things are averaged over time. This is because the summary statistics themselves vary less than the, the data on the individuals do. So if you take what the, um, if you take a scatter plot based on summary statistics and you apply it to individuals, you're going to come, you're not going to be using statistics well. Okay, because it doesn't account for the greater variability within individual performance. There is a strong positive linear association between weight in pounds and height in inches for men. If instead of data on individuals, we only had the mean weight for each height value, we would see an even stronger association. So over here, you see a lot of individual variability. In the first scatter plot, you can see that there is a lot more scatter. But what they did was then they took, say, like at 64 inches, there's a whole lot of weights there from well below 120 to almost 200. And so they averaged them all together, and they just took the average, okay, for each of the heights. There's much less variability there. Okay, you've got a much stronger association. So what you don't want to do is take what you see here with averages and then go back and try to apply it to individuals. That's not fair. It doesn't account for the fact that individuals have much greater variability. Means vary less than individual values like I've talked about before. Scatter plots of summary statistics show less scatter than the baseline data on individuals. This can give a false impression of how well a line summarizes the data. It's summarizing summaries, and so that's a whole different thing than summarizing individual observations. There is no simple correction for this phenomenon. Once we have summary data, there's no simple way to get the original values back. So what can go wrong? Make sure the relationship is straight. Check the straight enough condition, do your regression, and then go back and check it again with the residual plot. Be on guard for different groups in your regression. If you find subsets that behave differently, consider fitting a different linear model to each subset. Beware of extrapolating, especially of extrapolating into the future. Look for unusual points. Unusual points always deserve attention and may well reveal more about your data than the rest of the points combined. Beware of high leverage points and especially points that are influential. Remember, you're gonna see those better in scatter plots 
versus residual plots because they pull the lines to themselves. So often they'll have a small residual, but they should stand out in the scatter plot. Such points can alter the regression model a great deal. Consider comparing two regressions. Run regressions with extraordinary points and without, and then compare the results. Treat unusual points honestly. Don't just remove unusual points to get a model that fits better. Be aware of lurking variables and don't assume that association is causation. Watch out when dealing with data that are summary. Summary data's data tend to inflate the impression of the strength of a relationship. All right, let's look at some examples. Let's look at problem number 22 on page 218. Go ahead and pause the video for a second and look at the example. They've got a nice gra a couple of graphs there and they um, go into explaining it really well. So go ahead, pause the video. I'll be here when you come back. Okay, so we're going to answer four questions. What is the correlation between age difference in year? And then we're going to interpret the slope of the line. Then we're going to predict the average age difference in 2015 and describe reasons why you might not place much faith in that prediction. All right, so there is a negative association. We can see that in the scatter plot. Um, so R will be negative. So R is going to be negative square root of 0.751, which is approximately negative 0.8666. To interpret the slope of the line, you look at the you look at the computer output there, and if you look under variable, it's got constant. Well, that's going to be for your y-intercept, and then it's got year. So next to it, you've got coefficient. Okay, so the coefficient for the constant is 35.0617. That is your y-intercept. Next to year, you've got negative 0 0.16565. Okay, so that is the um, slope. Okay, so the negative means that you're going to have uh, that as y increases, x decreases, and as x increases, y decreases. And then we can go ahead, let's go ahead and round the um, slope to the nearest thousandth just to make it a little easier when we discuss it. Okay, so the interpretation, you have to have on average in there because remember, um, we're not saying this happens every single time, but on average, this is what will happen. On average, for every additional year that passes, the predicted difference in average age is decreasing by about 0.017 years. So for every one unit of change in your x value, the difference in the predicted y value, and this one's kind of weird because um, your y value is actually differences, okay? So in differences in average age. So the predicted difference in average age is now, since our slope is negative, it's going to be decreasing. If it were positive, we'd have increasing. And then by, and you want a wiggle word there too. We've got the on average for a little bit of wiggle room, and you want about for a little bit of wiggle room, 0 0.017 years. Predict the average age difference in 2015. So y hat is equal to 35.0167 minus 0 0.01665 times 2015, and we get 1.68. Now, we're not saying that you should expect the difference between ages of any particular couple to be 1.68 years, but they're saying that overall, the average of all couples in 2015, the difference would be um, 1.68. Reasons we might not want to place much predict faith in this prediction. We're extrapolating. Shame on us. We shouldn't do that. The trends could change. It could be a huge, you know, societal shift, and all of a sudden there's a big, big change in the trend that we've seen occurring. All right, let's look at problem 24. So again, stop for just a second. Go check it out. You've got more on the ages of the couples. Okay, welcome back. Why is R squared higher for the first model, the one in problem 22? Is the linear model appropriate for the post-1975 data? Explain why does this, what does the slope say about marriage ages and explain why it's not reasonable to interpret the y-intercept. All right, so why is R squared higher in the first model? The points that were omitted were points with high leverage. Since they followed the same linear trend as the rest of the data, R squared was strengthened by their presence and weakened by their removal. 
Is the linear model appropriate for the post-1975 data? Explain. Yes, the residual plot reveals no underlying pattern, and its spread is fairly small and even. Why, what does the slope say about marriage ages? On average, again, got to have that little wiggle word there, for each additional year that passes, the predicted age average, excuse me, the predicted average age difference decreases, negative slope, by about, another wiggle word, 0 0.23 years. Explain why it's not reasonable to interpret the y-intercept. The data be begin with x equals 1975. A year, of, excuse me, a y-intercept would be for x equals 0, making the interpretation of the y-intercept a huge extrapolation. So in the year that Jesus was born, what was the age difference? You know, it doesn't make sense because we, obviously there's going to be huge um, differences between life then and life now. Anyway, your model just can't go back that far. Problem 18. Let's look at that one. Okay, it's about um, grades and SAT scores. So go ahead and look at that. It might be interesting to you. Okay. So, what concerns you about the graph, the statistical methodology, or the conclusions reached? The graph shows a positive trend among average data for many individuals. There is too much variation among individuals themselves to make predictions for individuals based on patterns established by averages. That's a problem. There's no way to recover it. All right, look at problem 27. Oh, elephants and hippos. You might want to go back and look at 25 also just to get um, a little bit of background information. It's all about life expectancy and gestation for a bunch of, of animals. So go read the problem. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to answer a bunch of questions. A. Hey. By removing one of these points, we could make the association appear to be stronger. Which point in they want you to explain? Well, hippos, they don't follow the general trend. They have an extraordinarily long life expectancy relative to the gestation, um, a relatively short gestation period. Would the slope of the line increase or decrease? Well, the line would become steeper, so the slope would increase. Should we just keep removing animals to increase the strength of the model? Explain. No, we must have a good reason to remove the data point. If we remove elephants from the scatter plot, the slope of the regression line becomes 11.6 days per year. Do you think elephants were an influential point? Explain. Yes. Removing the data point lowered the slope from 15.5, which you can get um, from the original um, problem in problem number 25 to 11.6 days per year. So that is some serious influence. All right, guys, that's it. So now you've um, seen some examples. You're ready to go um, to come in and do some problems when you do your rounds. Make sure you bring the notes you, you took from this video as well as your outline of the chapter, and you should be ready to go. I'll see y'all in class. Have a good day.